Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the Science Symposium. Today we have Dr. Ashima and Maria and Melissa joining us from, Melissa's joining us from Ryerson University. Uh, before we get started, I would like to do a quick land acknowledgement and take the time uh, to reflect on our connection to the land and thank the traditional guardians of the land on which we at Swiss Vancouver live and work. So Vancouver is on the unceded traditional and who oh, unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. So we are in round two, which is drug discovery, and we're in our third presentation with Melissa from Ryerson University. And before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping rules and a little bit of an agenda. We'll be doing our presentation, then we'll have our presentation by, uh, or sorry, I'll have our introduction, our presentation by our speaker, a panel discussion with a Q&A from our judges, and then we will be having a Q&A from the audience. So while we're going through the presentation, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. That will be monitored and we'll be asking that after the panel discussion. Uh, you should know that today's video will be recorded and we please we ask that you keep all of your mobile devices and everything on mute to prevent um, and yourselves on mute during the presentation. And again, just to always remember to drop those questions and we love to see them. So we, before we get started, I would like to recognize that the Science Symposium would not be possible without the help of our sponsors. So we have a variety of different sponsors who have come on and helped make this what it is today. Um, Northeastern University in Vancouver. So they have a 95 employment rate in biotechnology. So if you're interested in that category, be sure to check them out. We have Admir Bioinnovations. So if you want to polish your skills in business or science, check out their programs today. Abcelera has come on and they are famous for discovering the antibody that neutralizes the viral variants of COVID-19. And we also have Accutus Therapeutics and they have provided the lipid nanoparticle delivery system that is a key element in the development of the Pfizer vaccine. There's also Microsoft, you can check out if you're looking for internships in IT, as well as Molly Surgical, who uses cutting edge magnetic technology to provide breast cancer patients with a better uh, experience over the traditional. Um, before I jump in to introduce our judges and our speaker, I also want to note that the Science Symposium is the brainchild and hard work of no Dr. Noeen, and she is the chair of the symposium, and she'll be in the background here today helping out with all the tech stuff, so please be sure to give her a wave if you see her come on screen. And with that, I will move on and I'll allow our judges to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about them before moving on to our speaker so Melissa can introduce herself and give her presentation. So with that, I'll stop sharing and I will pass it over to you, Dr. Ashima. Awesome. Thank you, Ashmi, and hello, everyone. My name is Ashima, and I am a research scientist at Quadrico, which is a hardware tech company based out of Toronto that is uh, focused on developing uh, highly sophisticated analytical instruments for non-invasive diagnosis of diseases. And uh, before joining Quadricore, I was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of California. And uh, my research experience spans both theoretical and applied work in the areas of structural biology and biochemistry. And uh, with that, I think I would say good luck to Melissa and I look forward to your talk today. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Maria. I'm the second judge today. Uh, I am currently a PhD candidate at the University of Montreal in Biomedical Sciences. I also have prior experience with a Masters of Neuroscience, particularly the domains of substance abuse, drug addiction, so in the areas of psychiatry, neuroimaging as well. Um, I'm also a formal medical science liaison for a biotechnology company here based in Montreal. I won't give any more information than that. Uh, good luck, Melissa. Best wishes and uh, looking forward to hearing you speak. Wonderful. So Melissa, if you want to give a quick introduction of yourself and then you can start sharing your screen and begin your presentation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Diamral. I am a master's student. I'll be starting my second year in September at Ryerson University in Toronto. I work under the supervision of Dr. Mark Adler and I'm looking at new techniques to make uh, amides using organosilicon reagents, will I, which I will be talking about in my presentation today. So I guess with that, I will share my screen 
and begin. Hopefully that's all right. Perfect. So my presentation is titled Silene Mediated Direct Amide Bond Formation. So the amide is one of the most common functional groups. It consists of a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen that's also bonded to a nitrogen. And we actually encounter amides quite often. They're found in about 25% of drugs on the market. The amide also makes up the backbone of many synthetic polymers known as polyamides. Important to us, amides provide the linkages between our amino acids that form our peptides and also our proteins. And amides are also found in many commercial products, such as this molecule here, that's the main component in insect repellent. But going back to amides and pharmaceuticals, amides are extremely prevalent here. And to demonstrate that, these are some of the top selling small molecule pharmaceuticals of 2020. And apixaban is number three. And so finding methods to make amides is very important in drug discovery and the pharmaceutical industry because of how relevant they are in drugs. And not only are they relevant in small molecule pharmaceuticals, but peptides are also used as therapeutics. And many peptides are used as therapeutics to mimic naturally occurring processes in the body. And they're used as a replacement therapy to aid the body where they are minimal or absent, such as using insulin to treat diabetes. But peptide drugs can also be used to disrupt protein-protein interactions and target receptor proteins, among others. And these are some examples of synthetic peptides that are used as drugs. This, pipe, this peptide here, glypromate, is naturally occurring, but it can be synthesized. And peptides like these can be synthesized by solid phase or solution phase peptide synthesis. And development and enhancement of methods to make new peptides is a relevant area of drug discovery that should be considered. But now getting into amide synthesis, if we think of the simplest and most convenient method to make an amide, it's just the reaction of a carboxylic acid and an amine with the removal of water to form the amide. And carboxylic acids and amines are the substrates of choice for this because they're widely commercially available. But if we attempt to do this synthesis, we encounter the formation of a stable and insoluble ammonium carboxylate salt. And this forms as a result of an acid-base reaction between the carboxylic acid and the amine. And then temperatures greater than 150 degrees Celsius are needed for water to be removed and the amide to form. And this becomes unfavorable when sensitive substrates are being used and having these harsh forcing conditions is not desirable. And so because of this, new methods had to be established. And so the most common method to make amides is the, is the use of reagents that will facilitate the reaction by activating the carboxylic acid in such a way that makes it easier for it to react with the amine. And these reagents are known as coupling reagents. So coupling reagents will activate the carboxylic acid and form a reactive ester that can react with the amine and form the amide. And these are some of the most common coupling reagents that researchers use to date. And these coupling reagents are advantageous to use because they can be used with sterically challenging substrates. They result in high yields of the amide. These reactions can be done under mild conditions and chiral integrity is also maintained using these reagents. But they are associated with some drawbacks, including being inefficient, expensive, hazardous. There has been reports of severe allergies being developed after extended exposure to one of the coupling reagents that I previously showed and they can produce a lot of waste. And because of these drawbacks, new methods need to be established. And the ACS Green Chemistry Institute Pharmaceutical Roundtable has addressed this issue and has listed sustainable direct amide bond formation as one of their top 10 key green chemistry research areas of 2018. And so to overcome these limitations, research groups have been looking into organosilicon reagents for, for amide synthesis. Organosilicon reagents are silicon-based compounds that have silicon bonded to carbon. Silicon is number 14 on the periodic table, and it's the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust as silicon dioxide, or what we know as sand. And these reagents are attractive to use in terms of greener chemistry because silicon is naturally abundant and environmentally benign. And these reagents are also safe and easy to handle and also easier to store in the lab. But only until recently has these silicon coupling reagents gained attention for amide synthesis. So these silicon reagents will activate the carboxylic acid into a reactive ester like we saw earlier. And this is what we call a silyl ester. 
and this reacts with the amine to form the amide. And these are the most recent coupling reagents that are reported from 2016 to 2020 for amide and peptide synthesis. And these uh, methods were highly efficient and also synthesized the amides and peptides in high yield without loss of chiral integrity. But they were associated with some limitations, especially having to heat the reaction for extended periods of time. This reagent here, known as tetramethyl orthosilicate, is specific, specifically hazardous to work with. And some of these do report a limited substrate scope, which limits their widespread use. And so there's still room to grow in terms of using silicon coupling reagents for amide synthesis. But I wanted to take a closer look at this reagent here, known as diphenylsilane. So diphenylsilane was used as a coupling reagent in 2017 by Charette and coworkers at the University of Montreal. And they used diphenylsilane for amide and peptide synthesis. They used a commercially available silane. They had a low ratio of starting material, which limits waste. The only byproducts of the reaction were hydrogen gas and an inert siloxane polymer. And also chiral integrity was maintained when doing peptide synthesis. But their reaction did require higher temperatures at longer reaction times and anhydrous and inert conditions were required for the amide to form. But with these ideas and others that were previously reported in the literature, we wanted to revisit diphenylsilane as a coupling reagent and explore a more efficient reaction. So we were looking to enhance the reaction using diphenylsilane as a coupling reagent. And first, we wanted to inhibit the formation of that ammonium carboxylate salt that forms that we saw earlier from the acid-base reaction between the carboxylic acid and the amine. And to do this, we can introduce a base into the reaction. And that would deprotonate the carboxylic acid and also maintain the nucleophilicity of the amine, because an amine like this does have reduced nucleophilicity. We also wanted to look at open to air reaction conditions to improve the practicality of our method, but it has also been seen that minimal amounts of water have been beneficial to some reactions that use organosilicon reagents. And lastly, we also wanted to look at microwave synthesis, so conducting our reactions in a microwave reactor. And the microwave can be used to decrease the amount of solvent and reaction times. And microwave assisted activation has been seen in some amide coupling reactions. And so with that, the first part of my research was looking at the role of air and moisture in the reaction, and also to see if the base does actually enhance the reaction. And we did this by studying the reaction of phenylacetic acid and benzylamine to form this amide using this base here known as N-methylpyrrolidine or NMPI, and it's a tertiary amine base. So looking at this table here, when we didn't add any base into the reaction, we weren't seeing a significant amount of product being formed when we ran this reaction at 80 degrees Celsius in the microwave. But once we added the base into this reaction, we did see a significant improvement in the yield. And when we ran the reaction without rigorous exclusion of air or water, which is the entry I highlighted in blue, we were seeing a good yield of the amide being formed. And to further investigate water in the reaction, we tried to add one equivalent, but that negatively affected the yield. And so all we can say is that our reaction is optimal without rigorous exclusion of air or water. Minimal amounts of water are needed and the base um, was shown to enhance the reaction. So then we did some optimization for our method where we looked at the best reaction conditions that would give us the highest yield of product. So first we looked at different organosilicon reagents that we can use as coupling reagents. Using the silane listed in entry one to four, we weren't seeing any amide product being formed. But once we tried diphenylsilane and switched the base to NMPI, we were seeing a good yield of the amide being formed. And we also found that one equivalent of diphenylsilane was required for our reaction. So next, we looked at some solvents that we can use as a medium for our reaction. So using the solvents listed in entry one, two, eight, we weren't seeing a significant amount of product being formed, but once we tried acetonitrile or MECN, and with some further optimization, we found optimal reaction conditions in the microwave, which I highlighted in blue, giving us an 89% yield of the amide. And so our previous optimizations were done in the microwave. And so we wanted to look at our reaction if we did uh, heat it in an oil bath. So 
we did find optimal reaction conditions at 100 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes, giving us a 91% yield of the amide. We also found that when we removed NMPI or the base from the reaction, even at a longer reaction time, we did see a significant reduction in the yield. We also found that the reaction can be run at room temperature, giving us an 81% yield of the amide after running it overnight. So then we conducted a substrate scope using our optimized reaction conditions to look at the various carboxylic acids and amines that we could use with our method. We did have to do some further optimization when using secondary amines and aromatic carboxylic acids. I didn't show uh, the specific, sub uh, specific reaction conditions here, but I can go over those in the question period. But with that, if we look here, I coupled various aliphatic carboxylic acids to various amines. And here we can see secondary amines, cyclic and acyclic, coupled to phenylacetic acid. And for all of these, we obtained moderate to excellent yields. Some of these were conducted in the microwave and at room temperature. Um, we got a comparable yield when we ran the reaction in the microwave compared to the thermal reaction. Uh, but we did see a slight reduction in the yield uh, when running it at room temperature. I also forgot to note that the yields under the amides represent an NMR yield and the ones in brackets represent an isolated yield of the amide. We were also able to synthesize this dipeptide uh, without compromising the chiral integrity, but further optimization would be needed to get a better yield of the dipeptide. We were also able to synthesize this amide on a gram scale, giving us a 72% yield. And for these amides here, we found that NMPI or the base wasn't needed to enhance the reaction. As when we ran, as when we synthesized these without NMPI, we were still obtaining an excellent yield. And lastly, we coupled aromatic carboxylic acids to benzylamine. And again, we found moderate to excellent yields. Some of these were ran in the microwave and at room temperature. And again, we saw a comparable yield to the thermal reaction when running it in the microwave, but did see a reduction in the yield when running them at room temperature. We also found that, again, NMPI was needed to enhance the reaction because when we removed NMPI, we saw a significant reduction in the yield. It's also important to note that pyridines, indoles, and imidazoles, and other heteroaromatic carboxylic acids are important heterocycles that are found in many drugs. And lastly, many amides do exist in molecules that are large that have diverse functionality. And so we wanted to conduct a robustness study for our method to test the functional group tolerance. So this is where we took our standard reaction and added different additives into it to see how much product was being formed and how much additive was remaining after the reaction has gone to completion. So with most of these additives here, we weren't seeing any cross reactivity as indicated by the green color. But with these additives listed here, we were observing cross reactivity. So we found cross reactivity with an additive that has a ketone, an aldehyde, an alcohol functional group, and this additive here that has an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And so in summary, we were able to develop a method that uses diphenylsilane as a coupling reagent, and we were able to synthesize various small molecule amides in good yield to have good, with good functional group tolerance. And with our method, we were able to address some of the current limitations of common coupling reagents. So we found enhanced, an enhanced reaction using NMPI as a base to inhibit the formation of that ammonium carboxylate salt. We also found optimal reaction conditions without rigorous exclusion of air or water. We had short reaction times, or we found that our reaction can be run at room temperature. We had a low ratio of starting material, which again limits waste. And the only byproducts of our reaction were hydrogen gas and an inert siloxane polymer. On the other hand, we did find low yield with sterically challenging substrates, and some substrates did result in a low yield of the amide and would need further optimization. Higher temperatures were required uh, to get shorter reaction times, and an additive or the base was required, which can be a problem in atom economy, but it is possible that it could be recycled. And although we were faced uh, with these issues, uh, our lab is currently working on synthesizing silane on synthesizing silanes for amide bond formation that would address these issues and others that have been previously reported in the literature. 
And with that, I would just like to thank, thank my supervisor, Dr. Mark Adler, Nick Jamku, who is a co-author on our paper, everyone in the MJA lab, the chairs of the symposium, and my judges for today, and everyone who came or who's in attendance today. Well, thank you for your presentation, Melissa. So I will pass this over to our judges now so they can do a Q&A. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there for you for that, with that. Do you want me to go first, Maria? Okay, awesome. Uh, great talk, Melissa. Uh, so I just have a couple of technical questions. Um, would you go on uh, slide 12 for me, please? All right. Uh, so you did talk about like uh, the space that worked for you, but like uh, I was wondering, like how many like different bases did you investigate under these conditions, and like did you observe like any surprising trends or results? Like was something unexpected that you observed? Yeah. So we did. We tried a whole bunch of different bases. So um, also here, this is triethylamine, which is also a tertiary amine base. We tried. Um, other bases such as uh, potassium carbonate um, or other carbonate bases, we weren't observing as good of a yield when we used NMPI as the base. So that's why we further optimized with NMPI. Um, we didn't see anything too surprising. Um, but yeah, NMPI was the base that worked the best, but we did try other bases that were similar Mm -hmm. But that was the one that worked the best. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I also have one a small technical question for you. I was wondering, um, so out of the available robustness screening tools, would you be able to provide a quick comment as to why you proceeded with the glorious method for your functional group tolerance test? Yeah, so I think, so we chose to do the glorious robustness study because I think like the functional groups that were listed in his papers were ones that are present in many like natural products or drugs. And we wanted to see if that those would be affected with our method. So I think just the list of functional groups that were in the different additives, which is why we chose to do this method. And there was a whole range of functional groups that were listed. So we went with this one. Perfect, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, so maybe to get you to slide 16 for me, please? Yeah. Sorry, there we go. No problem. Um, so maybe just you can comment on this a little bit. So uh, it seems like if you see one edge, which is aniline, you did not, looks like it is, does not work. Like uh, this is not a suitable substitute for the reaction. And then you were able to increase the yield to like 28%. So like, I was wondering like what changes were made to the reaction that actually resulted in this increased yield? Yeah, so, sorry, I have a supplementary side. So with the aniline substrate, we had to increase the reaction time to four hours because we were still seeing a lot of unreacted starting material. So we thought increasing the reaction time would help with that. Um, but we were only able to obtain a 28% yield. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, my second question. So I was very curious about uh, the other papers that you had mentioned who have done prototypical work in this area. Um, so I know that under, I believe it's under the Shahid paper, you had mentioned that it took their reaction about 42 hours. So I was wondering if for the other papers that you mentioned, is it on similar time scales or is it uh, something closer to more the 20 minutes that you're achieving? Yeah, so when using this silicon reagent here, they also observed um, longer reaction times. With using this one, they do... Some substrates did require only like one to two hours, but they also reported much longer reaction times that were similar to like the 40 hours. I think their range they listed was like one to 60 hours or something. So it depended on the substrate that they used. Um, with 
these two um, silicon reagents, I think, I can't exactly remember, but it must have been around like much longer than 20 minutes. So maybe an hour or something like that. Yeah, I don't remember the exact time. It's more than fine. I was more interested in the time scale to see if it was closer to your 20 minutes okay. if it was at the extent of 42 to, to three days of some sort. Okay, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I think the, my last question would be like, uh, if you go on your slide 16 and uh, where you saw, show those substrates and yes, yeah, that should be. Good. So uh, what it looks like, I think you did uh, comment on that, but maybe you could elaborate. Like, so if you see the um, uh, amides 1A and 3A, they show an improved yield when uh, the base is added. But if you see the trend is opposite for uh, the 2D and 2E. So uh, I was hoping if you could elaborate on that result a bit. Yeah, so we were thinking that so the amine substrates that are used um, is this N-morpholine and pyridine, I think. And these uh, amines are much more basic, so they would be more nucleophilic um, compared to these amines here or even these ones here. So I think that's why... NMPI wasn't needed to deprotonate the carboxylic acid and do that because these amine substrates were able to do that. And they're just, yeah, I think they're just more basic. That's why we didn't need the NMPI for the reaction. Thank you. I had a very similar question. <laughs> so that, that's all the questions that I had today as well. Wonderful, thank you to our judges for your questions today. We have a few questions from our audience, and I will attempt to pronounce these words that are not in my field at all. So please bear with me, Melissa, if I fumble something. And feel free to also check the chat box yourself to check up on what I'm saying to you. So okay. our first question is, do you think your reaction conditions can be modified to perform asymmetric amide synthesis? So, um, Asymmetric, is that what yeah. the question was? Asymmetric amide synthesis. Yeah, so it's possible. We didn't try, um, obviously, having the amide, like asymmetric amide synthesis. Um, but it's possible we would have to do further optimization, I guess. It has, I have seen silicon coupling reagents being used uh, for asymmetric amide synthesis, I believe. But yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, my cat is being annoying. <laughs> um, another question is what are the next steps now that you've made these discoveries? Yeah, so we, in our lab right now, and more of my master's thesis work is looking at more like different silanes that can do catalytic amide synthesis. So with catalytic amide synthesis, that would more address the issues that are associated with like inefficiency and atom economy and waste. And so having a catalytic reagent would more or less address all these issues. So we're looking into silanes for that and kind of just exploring different catalytic pathways for amide synthesis. Awesome, thank you. And then this is a question where I'm sure you're gonna to wanna to jump in the chat. Um, why do you think phenicillin and triphenicillin don't work for your reaction? Do you think it was the base or was it a property of the silanes? Yeah, so, um, so for triphenylsilane, it's most likely that it was too sterically hindered to do this reaction. Um, there has been computational studies investigating different silanes for amide synthesis, and they found that triphenylsilane was um, quite sterically hindered to do, uh, to get the siloester to form. With phenylsilane, it was quite interesting that it didn't work for a reaction because phenylsilane is quite often used for amide synthesis. Um, and it's reported quite often. So 
it's possible that it could have been the base. Um, we just didn't find maybe optimal reaction conditions when using phenyl silane, but it was surprising that it didn't work. Well, thank you. Another question is, can you define what is an NMR yield? Yeah, so when we, um, so a characterization technique that we use is known as NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And we can see the different protons that are, or the hydrogens that are in the structure. Um, so with that, we take our crude reaction mixture and we add an internal standard into it. And in this case, we used um, ethyl acetate as a internal standard and we would look at our NMR um, and then compare how much of the internal standard we have, which should be at 100%, and then compare it to how much of the product that we're getting. So we would look at the integration of these protons that are on this carbon here. Um, hopefully I explain that NMR spectroscopy is really complicated to explain. Um, we take like courses on it. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we have a follow up here and says, so you use H and N M R. Yeah. So we use the one H N M R. So proton N M R. Yeah. Okay. And in which peptides for drug discovery are you planning to use this synth synthesis technique? So we didn't attempt to make any like peptide drugs. We were able to synthesize one dipeptide um, just to explore and see if anything was happening with the stereocenters, um, but we didn't further explore any other dipeptide synthesis or any peptide drug synthesis. Awesome. And have you ever tried executing the reaction in an ionic liquid as a solvent? Um, no, actually. So I'm not too familiar with ionic solvents. Um, and I'm not sure if I've seen like amide synthesis in ionic sol solvents. Um, but yeah, I would have to further look into that to answer your question for that. Um, did you try to cross check yields using other MNR techniques? So we only looked at proton NMR for NMR yields, but we did use, or we did do isolated yields to make sure that we were making the amide. And also if we were getting um, comparable yields to the NMR yield. Well, so that is the end of our audience questions at this time. Thank you so much. Oh, one more is coming in. Um, how did you calculate that? The isolated yields. The isolated yields. So yeah. with these amides, we took our crude reaction mixture and we subjected it to column chromatography, which would um, separate out our product. And then we took the weight of how much of that was being formed and we calculated our isolated yield and compared it to the theoretical yield of the reaction. Mm -hmm. And did you check the purity of the isolated product? Yeah, so the isolated products were um, tested for purity by again proton NMR and we ran um, carbon NMR as well to compare them to literature spectra. So all of these amides were um, previously made and reported in the literature. So we used the literature spectra to compare. Um, except for this amide here, we did have to do a mass spectrometry on it to make sure that we were making this amide. Thank you. Yeah, so we had a little flood of last minute questions come in there. And I'll just give it a second to see if anything else comes in. Or if, Noe, I know you asked a few questions, but if you have any other ones that you'd like to bring forward. Oh, good. And from our judges, you're also good. And from our audience, this is also your time uh, to ask any other questions that you may have. 
I believe you said you invited your your lab group today. Yeah, I saw a few of them yeah, in the audience, so shout out to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful. Um, so well, we'll leave it with those for now. It was a good group of questions, and thank you for answering all those as they come in. Um, I want to say thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us and giving us your presentation today. That was really fascinating. And I would thank also you. like to say thank you to our judges for taking the time to come out and help us out with the science symposium. Um, so we can do our judges. I'll ask if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to give, and then I'll just quickly move on to some closing housekeeping. <laughs> I think we, no, no, I think we both have the same thing to say, so please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just said it was a really interesting work, uh, Melissa, and we really enjoyed your talk today. So, thank you so thank you. much. I also wanted to just add uh, congratulations on the publication of your paper. That is a huge achievement in graduate school, so that's a uh, huge kudos to you. And I, I'm, I'm assuming I have about, you have about a year left of your master's, correct? You're doing a two-year master's? Yeah, so I have a year left. Okay, so well, the best of luck for the continuation of your studies. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So I'll just share my screen for a second. Yep, sorry. And this one, and this one. And I'll just see if I can jump forward. So yeah, so thank you again so much to our judges and to you, Melissa and Noeen and everyone who came and watched this presentation today. If you would like to follow up on the rest of the Science Symposium presentations, you can go to Eventbrite, to Squist Eventbrite, and you'll see all of the events lined up there, and you can register for the ones you'd like to attend. And you can also go to the Squist website, and you'll find the events there. Our next Science Symposium event is happening on July 22nd. That will be the first presentation in our machine learning category, so it should be very fascinating. And if you're looking for any updates on the Science Symposium, you can always head to our website and check out the Science Symposium catalog that will be periodically updated with um, new information as it comes in. So be sure to check that out if you want anything there. And if not, you can also always contact myself or Noeen, the chair of the symposium, and we can answer any questions you might have. So with that, I think maybe I'm still sharing and I don't know how to get out of it. There we go. Uh, no, it was not. Uh, actually, you okay. didn't share. Oh, I didn't share? <laughs> but that's fine. I thought I could let it go. Oh, I thought it was working. It's, it's, oh. it's, it's good. It's good. No way. Well, thanks, Noreen. Um, hilarious. That's all from me. So, yeah, with that, I'll say again thank you so much, Melissa, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, yeah, everyone, thank for joining us today. It really means a lot. So I guess I'm good to go or? Yeah, you're good okay. Thank you. Okay, and awesome. Have any question, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Welcome, bye, take care. Bye. Okay. We are here now.